So the errors that we make in memory are errors that reflect what's going on in the world, our knowledge about the world, our assumptions about the world. They're not random errors. Our memories are also influenced by scripts and schemas. Let me give you an example. There's a phenomenon called pragmatic inference, practical inferences that we make. So, if a statement or a sentence that you read or a statement that you hear is missing information, you spontaneously fill in that missing information. Let me give you an example. If I say, some of the students passed the exam, some of the students passed the exam, you can infer from that that some of the students failed the exam, right? Why would I say some of the students passed the exam unless some of them failed? Now the statement some of the students passed the exam would still be true if everyone passed the exam, but nobody makes that inference. For example, uh, my old PhD advisor, Roger Shepard, would tell everybody that his wife was his first wife. Now, they would draw the inference that he had married someone else. So it was always very puzzling to them. Why is this guy hanging out with his first wife? Well, she was his only wife. It's true, she was a first wife, but she was the only wife, right? So pragmatic inferences. We fill in missing information all the time. And we do that filling in based on schemas and scripts. A schema is a structure for holding knowledge. So for example, you have a schema for what a grocery store contains. So a grocery store will contain bread and milk and eggs, probably will not contain uh, tires, for example. So you have a schema for what a bank contains and what a Starbucks contains and what a grocery store contains what might be in a textbook. You have a schema for all of that. It's basically a set of expectations. A script is the same thing, but with a script, time is added. So you have a script for what happens when you walk into a restaurant. One of the things that's been weird about COVID is that things work in new ways and we don't always have scripts for those new ways. We have to develop them. Schemas and scripts shape change, alter our memory in systematic ways. And I'm going to tell you about an absolutely classic study that I love. Here's a study. Students think that they're coming to participate in some study, like you guys did in Psychology 150 and 250 when you had to complete um, so many research experiments. So they show up for this research experiment the researcher says, you know what, the previous subject isn't quite done yet. Please wait in this office until the next person's done and I'll come and get you in just a few minutes um, and then take you to the experiment. So the person sits down in the room, the door closes, 35 seconds goes by. So they spend 35 seconds in this room and this is before cell phones. So when you were seated someplace, that's what you paid attention to. Uh, the experimenter comes back and says, okay, we're ready for you now. They take you to another room and say, okay, the experiment is this. Write down everything that you saw in that office that you waited in for 35 seconds. So what is your memory for the contents of the office? That's the whole study. People's memories for the contents of the office was skewed, and it was skewed in the direction of their schema for an office. So in the old days, offices had lots and lots of books, lots, because you couldn't easily find information on the internet because it wasn't there. So old professors and very successful professors would have a wall of books, always there. But this office didn't have books. This office didn't have a telephone. Now again, this is before cell phones, so every office had a telephone. It fit in people's schemas for an office, but there was no telephone in this office. What happened? 30% of the subjects remembered there being books. There were no books. False memory. Many remembered there being a telephone. There was no telephone. So you can make predictions about memory errors based on people's schemas and scripts. So 
what these researchers expected is that if the contents of the office was consistent with somebody's schema of what an office contains, they would correctly remember that. And they did. People remembered there was a desk and chairs and shelves. All the stuff that you would expect, that they remembered. The stuff that you would expect to find in an office, but that was not in that office, people would falsely remember it having been there. And the reverse was true. If there were things, and there were things, in that office that you would not expect in a particular office, including a skull and a bottle of wine, people failed, many people failed to remember that those things were in the office. So our memories are shaped by our scripts and our schemas, our understanding of the world. Um, I'll give you an example from my own life. So my mother was Irish Catholic. The first president, the only president so far in the United States who's been Catholic, was John F. Kennedy. And so John F. Kennedy was like a saint in my family. Uh, his wife was never, no human being could be good enough for John F. Kennedy in my family. But he, you know, married Jacqueline Kennedy, and uh, she was never going to be good enough. The day that John F. Kennedy was assassinated, uh, he was, uh, he and the um, governor of Texas, I believe, were in a car, and they were driving around waving to the crowds. Uh, it was an open-air car, and uh, a person shot uh, the president twice and killed him, and the governor was shot, and it was a, it was a terrible day. After the shots rang out, Jacqueline Kennedy, Onassis, in this um, pink suit that is in museums now, uh, tried to crawl out of the car. Right? They were actively being shot at. And you can see in the picture on the bottom there, there she is crawling out of the car, and a Secret Service man is, is uh, crawling towards her in the car as the car and the motorcycles are driving uh, quite quickly to get away from the shooter. Now, remember in my family, uh, Jacqueline Bouvier Kennedy is never good enough. So I had always remembered that scene as cowardly, <laughs> cowardly Jacqueline Bouvier Kennedy running away from her husband in his time of need. Much to my horror, about 15 years ago, I saw a documentary in which that particular Secret Service man was interviewed about JFK's assassination. And do you know what he said? He said it was the most amazing thing. What Jacqueline Bouvier Kennedy was doing was collecting pieces of her husband's skull and brains so that the surgeons could sew them back up together. In other words, she was risking her life to put her husband's brain back together, not trying to run away from the scene of the crime at her husband's time of need. Completely wrong. So my memory, my perception of the event was completely wrong based on my erroneous belief that Jacqueline, the First Lady, Jacqueline Bovia Kennedy, couldn't possibly be a wonderful, amazing, dedicated wife. Scripts, schemas, stereotypes, biases, they all affect our memory. So let me give you another example of a script. So here we go. John was feeling very hungry as he entered the restaurant. He settled himself at a table and noticed that the waiter was nearby. Suddenly, however, he realized that he had forgotten his reading glasses. So how is the last sentence of that statement related to the middle sentence. He settled himself at a table and noticed the waiter was nearby. Suddenly, he realized he'd forgotten his reading glasses. Why would he realize he had forgotten his reading glasses? What does that have to do with the restaurant? The thing that's excluded from that statement is he opened the menu to read it. Right? But imagine that I read you that paragraph and then waited 15 minutes and asked you to write down everything you could remember from the paragraph. What do you think the odds would be that someone would remember the paragraph containing the words, he opened his menu or he reached for the menu 
And then he realized he didn't have his glasses. I think the odds are quite good. So schemas and scripts are structures that we use to hold memory based on their meaning. And they have a very strong influence on our memory. So again, this is more evidence that memory is not exact. We have all of us experience memory errors. Our memories conform to our personal beliefs about the world. So memory is something we construct. It's not a perfect representation of what actually happens out there in the world. It is our understanding of what happened out there in the world. What are the advantages and disadvantages of using constructive approaches to memory? Well, the advantages are it enables us to fill in missing information, right? It enables us to make predictions about what will happen next. It speeds up our ability to respond to information. Um, it helps us to organize our memories and, and remember them better. The disadvantages? As a result of all of these constructive processes, sometimes our memories are just plain wrong. Um, we expect things, but the world doesn't always give us what we expect. And sometimes we make memory errors with no awareness of having made those errors. Come back and we're going to start talking about the kind of errors that eyewitnesses can make. But you make them too.